Last week we talked about what it means to be a leader. Right? What does it mean to be a leader? Not only what it means to be a leader, but how do you become one? And I said the main part of Yahushua taking over Moshe Rabbeinu was not his intellect, and it wasn't that he had protection, he wasn't from the family, as much as he was Mishamesh. He was actively involved in in Moshe's day-to-day life, from the running the big conferences to the very small things that the nation needed. And more than learning from books and lectures, the internship is what counts. The what? The internship is what yeah, counts. Oh, right. The internship. Yeah, yeah. Right? Here we go. Before we could actually open the Sefer Yehoshua, though, we have to bridge the gap. We have to go back first to the end of... It's on. We have to go back to the end of Dvarim. We have to go back to the end of Dvarim and figure out what's happening up until Yehoshua. Right? Up until Yehoshua. What's happening? So if you look at Dvarim, Lamed Dalet, we're in the Zot HaBracha, the last parish of Dvarim, Right, the last one. If you look at Pasuk Dalit. So we have Moshe Rabbeinu a month before he passes away. You have to understand, here Moshe Rabbeinu is the leader. It's more than just a parent. It's, he's leading the nation through the, the rough and tumble from leaving Egypt to the glorious Har Sinai, to the, you know, Rafidim, Emrek Rifaim. They've been together for 40 years. Right? 40 years is a long... You know, thank God my parents had their... 43rd anniversary, right? So, you don't meet people who normally make it past the, you know, the 7 year mark, the 25 year mark. 43 is Bliya and to be together, they should be together. You know, they said if they made it up until now, eh, not worth getting divorced. But the truth is, you know, it takes a lot to stay together. Moshe Rabbeinu led the Jewish nation 40 years. 40 years he's with them. And at this point, Hashem says, Adkan, your job's up. And we have a very interesting exchange over here. If you look at Pazuk Dalit, Shem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, come stand on top of the mountain. Right? Come stand on top of this mountain. They're in the valley of Arvot Mov. So Hashem says, come, come on top of the mountain. And I want you to do something. And Hashem says to him, you see this land where you're looking into? He said, Zot ha'aretz asher nishbati la'avraham li'itzrak u'liyakov. You see that land? That's the land that I promised Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Lemo, what did I say? Lizarecha et nena. I'm going to give it to your children. I, this is the land. We're standing here just about to go into Israel. Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, come see. Years and years ago, years ago, I told Abraham Avinu, this is the land I'm going to give to your children. And right now we're standing at the threshold of just about to go in. Right? Come see it, he says. Come see it with your eyes. Right, come give it an ayin tova. You know, when sometimes we see things, we have such narrow vision. Right, sometimes we have tunnel vision. We can only see one thing and we can't see the big picture. But sometimes we have a different problem. It's called narrow vision. Right, we can't see things with a big eye, with an open eye. She has more than I do. Her children are better than mine. They got into this guy. And, you know, it doesn't stop. I remember I used to go to the nursing home to visit the old ladies. And it's amazing to see how they're 70, 80, 90 years old. And they're still fighting. She got the meal first. Why did you visit her? Why don't, I remember one lady telling me, don't go visit Margie. I said, why? Because first you should come to me. You're 90 years old. Your day's not running away to anywhere, right? You have a whole day and a whole tomorrow and a whole next day. But sometimes when you have narrow vision, if you don't work on it, it doesn't go away. In fact, it gets more narrow the older you get. Right? Why do her children call her more often and she has a nicer car? Mm-hmm. Shem says, come look at the land because I want you to give it an ayin tova. I want you to look at Eretz Yisrael. I want you to bless it. True, you're not going to be able to come in. But I want you to inspire the land and infuse it with good. And here we have a very important sentence, though, that we have to stop by. Hashem says, I want you to see the land, Asher Nishbati Laavraham Liyitzchak Liyakov. What does Nishba mean? What's the root? Sheva. Sheva. What's the, what, oh. Sheva or Shavua. What does that mean? Oh. Mm-hmm. Promised. Mm-hmm. It's a promise, right? A Shavua is a promise. It's also a week. Shavua. Shavua. Not Shavua. Shavua. Right? He says, I promised this land to him. You know, today, and we're going to talk about it soon, what happened last night in Israel. 
early morning. We are not really good at PR. You know why? If you ever look at the Jewish nation, we're almost the biggest self-hating Jews. We're as busy. I remember when I was at Hebrew U, one of the students there, his name was Sam Weissman, young 19-year-old from Philadelphia. So he said, you know, the biggest problem in Israel is, I said, what? He said, the, the settlers. I said, really? Maybe you're the biggest problem in Israel. I said, why the settlers? He said, because they're the ones who are causing conflict. They're the ones who are taking away land. I said, really, Sam, you believe this? He said, absolutely. I said, so you're one of the self-hating Jews that are causing the, causing the destruction over here. And he got really angry. Mm -hmm. Not really angry. But the truth is, we're so worried about what the world thinks and how we're going to present ourselves that we really shoot ourselves in the foot. Right? And we try to bring up, so we had the, the 1948 resolution. We're almost at the head. What? We move up, we're almost at the head. Almost, right? hundred mm percent. -hmm. Right, you have organizations that are... As soon as we gave them the keys to hell about it. We're crazy, mm -hmm. crazy. Right? Moshe Dayan had it. We had it. We had it in our hands. And what happens? You know, we try to rewrite history, and we're forever trying to please the other nations. Why? Right? So we say this war, you know, we really won the Golan, but we're going to give it back to you. Really? 1967? We won the Sinai Desert, we'll give it back to you. And then we have problems like Aza, and we have problems up with Syria, and we wonder, you know, from a political stand, we're bringing very weak arguments. We're bringing very weak arguments. In the end of the day, if you look at the Middle East, right? I mean, the huge superpowers that are there, are all Arab countries, from Saudi Arabia to Syria to Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Iran. We really don't belong there, right? We Technically, we don't belong there. And if we were looking for a good piece of real estate, Uganda was, with all the problems that we have in Israel, Uganda looks good already, right? Okay, so it's swampy and there are diseases and now maybe Ebola travel down there. But we're not doing a good job with our PR as to why we really deserve Israel. Why do we really deserve Israel? Oh. So we have to go back to Breshit. It's true that we're dealing with Dvarim. Right? It's true that we're dealing with Dvarim. We have to go back to the first sentence in Breshit. Right? Let's go back to Breshit. If you open up to Breshit, Perk Aleph, Pasuk Aleph. Yeah? So the Pasuk tells us, Breshit bara lokim et hashamayim vet haaretz. Kodesh Baruch created the heaven and earth, and it continues with all the six days of creation. So Rashi, or Shlomo Yitzhaki, you would think he's living in today's generation. It's amazing. What does he say? He has a question. Right? The famous question is, if the Torah has a book of law, right, you're not going to find any of that until you get way into Shemot, right, where the first communal mitzvah we get is, HaChodesh HaZelachem, Rosh Chodesh. Right? The first mitzvah we get as a nation, as a group, it's true, we got into the pool, to have children, right? You have different mitzvahs scattered, but as a nation, the first mitzvah we get is, already in Shemot. So why are we starting with the whole Sefer Bereshit? Right? Why are we starting with the Sefer Bereshit? Who needs the whole storyline? First there was nothing, then Hashem created the world, six days, then you have the story of humanity and how they failed, and we start again. Who needs all this? Yeah, you also want to know? Let me give them to my husband. What? Rabbi Yoni? Come on, take it. He's not so happy. <laughs> Thank you. That works. Yeah. Right, so it's a good question. Rashi gives us an even nicer answer. In Tehillim, David HaMelech says, Koach Ma'asav, right, the strength of his work, of his creation, he gid lamo, he told his nation, why? Latet lahem nachalat goyim. So he could give them the inheritance of the goyim. Again, David HaMelech says, why did Hashem have to talk all about creation? Latet lahem nachalat goyim. To give the inheritance of the nations to his nation. And Rashi says, you know what's going to happen? Shem knew what would happen in the world. When the Jewish nation would come to Canaan, what would they say? Eh, listen at them. You don't belong here. You don't belong here. It's not your land. Right? Who are you? You're coming to take over the country now. It's not your land. Give it back. If you would give it back, it would peace, right? Peace for peace. Right? If you would just have peace. We're just watching in school. My girls were showing me this clip. So one of the Arab guys said, you know, if, if Israel would just give back the whole land, then there wouldn't be any wars. 
right? That, that's true. There wouldn't be any Israeli either. There wouldn't be any Jews, right? So they would come and they would say, "You know, I'm not true." Of course, it's, it's not true. <laughs> you know. We do urine there before forty-eight, and the slaughter six million. I mean, it's ridiculous. Oh. Argument. So, firstly, it's a ridiculous argument. If you and look at the history, else would take us either. That that's for sure, but that's not their we've problem. We've been there for oh. thousands of years. So, True, but you know what? There's countries that have changed places over and over again. And there was a time that we didn't have... There were always Jews in Israel. There were always Jews in Israel. We didn't always have the majority, but there were always Jews. And you know, those people who think... This is a great argument everyone always says. Before 1948, there was peace. My friends, you clearly don't know history because the Hebron massacre happened in 1929. And the massacres, you know, my, my father grew up in Israel when it was still Palestine. On his birth certificate, it says Palestine. Yeah. So you'd always say, you think the Arabs are friendly because you didn't grow up with them. If you would have grown up with them, you would know that they're not friendly. You would know that they're not, a, you know, Rabnei Kahana. Today, if you go, yeah. Mm-hmm. Somebody sent me an email yesterday that. They sh- with a picture of a flag of Palestine. Because you were starting it with the blue background. <laughs> you know they, if that's true. Marlene, you, you know what they say. Mm-hmm. There was somebody that got up and was talking to um, Arafat and his followers in the, back in the day and he said, you know, I want to tell you a little bit about Jewish history. He said, you know, when Moses crossed over the river, right, he crossed and he was he crossed the Jordan, he was going to come into Israel, so he took off his clothes because he didn't want it to get wet. And when he came back, and when he came back, he realized that one of the Palestinians stole his clothing. And Arafat says, excuse me, you could tag anything off us, but we weren't even there. He said, uh-huh, that's a point. <laughs> uh-huh, all right. Right. So you have to understand. Like, I, you, 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 I always say that the Palestinian Liberation Organization was founded in 1965. And the Six Day War, where we got all sure. the uh, territories, was in 1967. So what the heck would they wanted to liberate in 1965? Nothing. 100%. No, all of so, Israel. It's but you know what our problem is? You know, That's what they always want. Yes. We have a problem. There's a great quote that I love. It says, never argue with an idiot. Because he drags you down to his level and then beats you with experience. Right? And that's what we do. Our biggest, best argument is this. Kodesh Baruch says, you know why I take the time to tell you about creation? Trust me, you and, our, you and I are never going to build another world. Right? That's not our job. Trust you, you and I, a flood is never coming again. Hashem said it's not going to happen. Hashem says, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened, who created the world, so you know who it belongs to. I want you to know the world is mine. And because it's mine, right, I can choose who to give it to. And Hashem says, you're right. Before Avram came, the Kenanim were living there, and the Chivi, and the Chiti, and all the different Amim. Right? There were a lot of nations there. Hashem said, but, but let me walk you through. Exactly, seven to be exact. Right? Kenani, Chiti, Chivi, Prizi, Amori, Yivusi, Girgashi. Yeah? Wow. So we have the way the Gilgashim were the only one who left like on their own. Correct, yeah. correct. They were, they were the smart ones. Yeah. Right. Hashem says, come, I'm going to walk you through the process. We're going to have to give him back, I think. Yeah. Rabbi Yoni? Ah, I'll take yours a little. <laughs> Just a little bit. I tell you. So let's walk through the process. I'm not so happy. He was kidnapped from me. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shem says, firstly, I created the world. Now you want to see what's going to happen to the land of Israel? So we have to walk through the process. So let's open up to, if you open up to Lech Lecha. Right, just a few weeks ago, we had the Parshat Lech Lecha. Perik Yud Bet Pasuk Vav. So we know, Shem tells Avram Avinu, you're searching for me, you want to be connected, you're choosing me, I'm choosing you. But the first step is Lech Lecha. You gotta leave. You gotta leave. And Hashem says, Vayavor Avraham Baaretz. Right? He's crossing over from Haran. And he comes Ad Makom Shrem. He comes till Shrem. Shrem. Yesterday I told my girls about Shrem and Yosef at Zadik. And they said, Where is Shrem? Is that in New York? I said, Are you kidding me? If we don't know our own map. One of the right? few places that were bought. Right. Of course, exactly. right? So he comes Ad Makom Shechem, Ad Alon More, Vaknani Az Baaretz. Who is in this land, this prized possession? The Knani. What does Hashem say? Vayera Hashem El Avram. Hashem appears to Avram. Vayomer, and he says, and this is something so important. He says, Lizaracha Eten Etaretz. You know who this land is going to belong to? 
it's going to be yours. It's going to belong to your children. I created the world, and I get to choose who the land belongs to. Forget about winning every single war, which we did. Hashem says, the land belongs to your children. Not only does he say it once. Yeah, I'm taking it. I know, I know. <laughs> you have competition here. I know. Wow. Well, you get to see him more than I do. This is true. You want to do that Mondays? Yeah. <laughs> He's always good. This is what babies are supposed to do. You know, if Chas Shalom they didn't cry, then it wouldn't be good. It would be terrible. So they're doing good. So let's see how many times Hashem tells Abraham, this land belongs to you. You know, not once, not twice. If you go to Lech Lecha, Yud Gimel, Pasuk Yud Dalid. Oh, beautiful. After Lot, after Lot and Abraham split up, right? Hashem Amar el Abraham Achrei he pared Lot. As long as Lot was with him, Hashem said, "I don't belong there in this partnership. Lot is a rasha. I can't be here." Once Lot leaves, Hashem shows himself again to Abraham, and he says, "Sanei necha, pick up your eyes. Look, urei min hamakom asher atasham." Right from where you're standing, look at Svona, Vinegba, Vikedma, Viyama. Look in all the directions. Where's Tzafon? North. North, right? North. Negba is? Darum. The Negev is Darom, south, right? Kedma, Mizrach. Mizrach, and Yama is? Marav, right? Yama is west. He says, lift your eyes and look every single direction. North, south, east, west. You see this land? I'm giving you the whole land. I'm not giving you pieces. I'm giving you the entire land. Everything you see, I'm giving it to you. And I'm giving it to your children forever. We're not doing exchanges. We're not giving peace for land and land for peace. The land belongs to you. I'm giving it to you. And it's yours for keeps. Let's look at Lech Lecha Tedvav. Yeah, if you go on a little bit further. Uh, which pasuk is that exactly? Just tell me. That's a really good one to know. Yama vaked matzvona vanegba. No, no. What number is it? What pasuk is it? I, I don't know off, off okay. the bat, but okay. I can try to find it. All right. Okay. okay. No, no problem. We have. If you look at Ted Vav, pasuk um, Perak Ted Vav pasuk Zayin. Avraham Avinu says to, to God, he says, it's true, I know you promised to give me Israel. I know you promised to give me this land, Canaan, it's going to be mine. But if you look at Zion, right? he said, you know me. I took you out of the burning furnace in Orkastim. I've given you this land, not just temporarily, but Lirishta is, what's a Yerusha? It's an inheritance, right? It's an inheritance. You get father to son, father to son. So Abraham says, How am I going to know that I'm going to get it? Right? And Hashem says to him, You know what? You're right. An inheritance can sometimes be taken away. Sometimes it is yours. Sometimes it's contingent on other things. Hashem says, I'm going to make with you not just an inheritance. It's going to be a brit. It's going to be a covenant. Meaning we're going to make a contract that cannot be broken. And that's where we have the story of the Brit Ben Haptarim. Right? Hashem tells him to cut up different animals and a pillar of smoke comes and Avram falls into a deep sleep and he has the vision. Right? He has a vision of Bnei Israel going into Galut, the Shibud Mitzrayim, and eventually coming back home. Eventually coming back home. And Hashem says, don't worry, it's not just... It's not just a Yerusha. It's not just an inheritance. It's a Brit. It's a covenant. It's yours. It's a contract that cannot be broken. But now we have a problem. Because Yishmael, the Muslims, they know the parashot too. Right? They know our history. What's their claim though? More than Brit Mila. It's true. Hashem gave the land to? To? Abraham. Abraham. What's their claim? I'm also a child. I'm also a child. Right? If I'm a child and Hashem gave it to him, so then fear is square. Not only am I a child, but what am I? 
I'm, I'm the oldest. And the oldest we know by Yerusha gets gets Pishnayim. Gets Pishnayim. Gets double. Right? Gets double. And his whole claim to fame is if I'm the son of Ibrahim, right? I'm the son of Abraham, so then I deserve Pishnayim. The problem is they don't really know how to read Tanakh. Because if you continue on over here to Parshat Vayera, yeah, we're walking through the Parshiot. We go to Parshat Vayera, Perk Chof Aleph, Pasuk Yud Bet. Perk Chof Aleph, Pasuk Yud Bet. So here we have a problem. Yishmael and Yitzchak never got along from day one. You talk about peace with the Muslims, it never will work, it never did work. Our history never started off, there was no peace. You know, back to Rebbe Kahana. Today, if you walk around Yerushalayim, you'll see a lot of the graffiti. It says, Kahana Tzadak. Mm-hmm. But years ago when he spoke, they put him in jail, and they put him back in jail, and eventually they had him assassinated, and his son, yeah? It wasn't a nice history with Rebbe Kahana. He was the one Knesset member that was banned from everything that was illegal in, the, in, in Israel. And somehow he, w- he would give speeches, everybody would walk out of the room and he continued to speak. Because people didn't want to hear the truth. Correct, yeah. Right? It's amazing. Amazing who they let speak, right? You know, sometimes for being so politically correct, we end up really hurting ourselves. We're being so politically correct and we hurt ourselves. Yeah? So what did he say? He used to say, you know, I said, I understand the Arabs, right? And they understand me. He said, but we both don't understand the state of Israel. Right? We both don't understand the state of Israel. He said, if you would listen to what they're telling us, they are, you know, the Iranian president recently, they, they keep repeating it, they must have the same script. So he said, you know, he's not, they're not going to be satisfied until there's not one Jew left in Israel and the Jordan River is flowing with Jewish blood. And then you say, come, let's have peace talks. Right? I was listening to Obama's response. We want to make sure the tensions don't escalate on both sides. And you wonder, who's the crazy one here? Right? Look at our history. It never, we, we never got along. Right? So what happens? Sarah says to Avram, send him away. He's a bad influence on Yitzhak. Yishmael brought in Avod Zarah. He was busy firing arrows at Yitzhak. He was killing. He, he didn't belong in Avram's house. And it was tough. In the end of the day, he was Avram's child. And Avram said, no, I don't want to send him away. We'll send him to rehab, we'll bring him back home, we'll bring rehab to us. And what does Hashem say? Hashem says, no. Oh, he says, listen to your wife. And it's a good rule of thumb always, listen to your wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah, listen to your wife. Should we say it louder? No. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens? And Hashem says, don't feel bad. Don't feel so bad. It's true, it's something really, really painful and we should never be tested to have to send the child away. He says, Kol asher sara, Everything that Sarah tells you, Shma b'kola. Listen to her. Listen to her because she knows. We know that Sarah was a greater... Nivuah. She was a greater prophet than Avraham Avinu. And God says, listen to her. Why? Ki b'yitzrak yikare lecha zara. Because Yitzrak is going to be your offspring. You want to know who the Zara, who the Zera of Avram is? You have to still read the Tanakh. It's true that Hashem keeps saying, Ki nena lizaracha. But the only one who's called Zera from Avram is Yitzhak. The only one who's given the title child, offspring of Yitzhak, uh, of Avram, is Yitzhak. Right? The second Pasuk actually says that. No. Because it says, Vegam et ben Ama le Goya Simeno. Oh, what does it mean? It means he'll be a different nation. Beautiful. It's not the same nation. Beautiful. He's going, to, he's going to be a different nation. And if you look into actually um, the Svono, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the Svono over here says, what does it mean that he's going to be Zaracha? Yeah, I'll just see. So it says, Vishmael ubanav yuavadim lo. Yishmael and his children are going to be servants. They're not going to be the children. They'll be servants, they'll have their own nation. And it's okay that they'll have their own nation, but they're not the continuation of Avraham. They're not the contributors where the land it belongs to them. They're not holding the deed. They're not holding the deed. Right? But so we have a problem, though. Because here we're facing a world that, on the one hand, we have Yishmael screaming, right? It's amazing if you. 
and I was watching the vi- some video clips of different, and it's scary to see that when they kill, what do they always scream? Allah Akbar. Right? God is great. God is great. And it's a scary thing. We t- talked about it a little bit last week, that we're not just dealing with a political nation as much as there's a spiritual internal war going on here. You know, a lot of times we tag things onto politics, right? Which is, a, it's, politics do play a ro- role in the world, right? The truth is it does. You need an army, you need a country. You know, thank God today in Israel we have an army. Thank God. Baruch Hashem. We have an army. We have a state that belongs to us. Yeah, you know, 60, 70 years ago, when you were Jewish walking around in Israel, you weren't safe. Today, by and large, I was looking. Who responds to the terror attacks? The Mishtara. So whether you like them or not, the state of Israel is doing good things for the Jews, not just for the, uh, the outside world, for the Jews. The fact that you can get over an airplane and you feel safe in Ben Gurion's airport, right? Maybe you don't agree with the philosophies and the ideas and the ideals. Okay, that's okay. But at least we have to have a hakarat tov for the people who are running the show. Right? You don't have to agree with everything they do. But we have to have hakarat tov. But we also have to realize that more than politics playing a role, there's something spiritual going on here. There's some, you know, look at Israel. They say it's about the size of New Jersey. Yeah, if you've ever been to New Jersey, they always say the people from New Jersey are always peeking at their windows trying to be like New York. That's the only thing they keep busy with. Right? And it's true. Right? They're always peeking in. What's happening in New York happens in New Jersey. New Jersey's nothing. It's a dot on the map. It's a nobody. Yeah, it's a nobody. And the entire world, for centuries, it didn't just happen today, for centuries have been fighting from the Crusades, back it up even more, to the switch hands from the Turks to the British. You know, the British think that they were the big high and mighty. They gave us the land. They don't realize it switched hands so many times before then that, okay, so they signed the resolution and then they signed the white paper, right? So they forget about the 1922, the, the League of Nations. A hundred percent. Everybody vetoed it. Everybody, everybody, everybody forget You know, about when the they came Nation. together, everybody's good idea was send the Jews to Uganda. Let's get them out of the way. We'll send them to the African jungle. We're for sure they're going to be ripped apart. Uh, you know, one thing the Jews aren't good at is self defense. We're good at other things, but send us to the African jungle, we wouldn't have made it out. Yeah? That's not where we're but, supposed to be at. Oh, but. But there's something spiritual that's going on over here. And we have to not just target it on the political level, but also we have to figure out what's our job over here. Right? What, what's it meant to be for me? So we have to go back into Dvarim. And the answers are always going to be in the Torah. Always. Because this is the only book that we have a Kadosh Baruch Hu talking directly to us. After that, after the Tanakh, so we have a lot of commentary. Right? But this is directly from a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And if you look at Parshat Ekev, So again, back to Moshe Rabbeinu, we're in the desert. And Moshe Rabbeinu is giving them Musar. And if you open that up to the beginning of Parashat Ekev. There you go, it's going to be over here. Oh. Now Moshe Rabbeinu was a very smart leader. He said, I'm going to wait until the end, end of, it, of his life to give the Jews Musar. You know, you have to know when and what to give to who. You know, just because you have something smart to say to somebody, doesn't mean you have to immediately jump at them. Moshe says, I want to give them Musar that they'll be able to take. I'm going to wait until the end of my life so that they know I have no personal interest here. It's not going to affect me. It has nothing to do with me. It's not a personal attack from me to them, back at me. Right? And he's standing there and he says, V'haya ekev tishmun. If you listen to everything that Hashem says, right here we just spent 40 years not just learning Torah, living Torah, living the model that Hashem wants, and now your job is going to be to transport that. It says, And you're going to listen, right? You're going to do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells you. So you know what's going to happen? If you're going to follow HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you're going to listen to the Torah and mitzvot, Hashem tells us very simply, V'shamar Hashem elokecha lecha et ha-brit v'et ha-chesed asher nishba l'avotecha You know what's going to happen? When you make a deal with somebody, what do they normally do? You shake hands. Right? You can't make a deal with yourself because there's no other side to shake a hand with. Right? Kodesh Baruch says, I made a deal with you. But the deal is two-sided. Right? The deal is two-sided. If you're going to keep your part of the deal, guaranteed, I'm keeping mine. Guaranteed. Let's look inside. Oh, Hashem says, I'm going to keep it. And what's going to happen? 
Look at this beautiful picture that Moshe Rabbeinu paints of us. He says, You're going to be loved. Everybody's going to love you. They're going to say Jew. And you know what that's going to bring to mind? People are going to say, wow, that's God's nation. Rabbi Katzenstein from Muncie was once at Mount Rushmore. And he said there was a family that came over to him and said, do you mind if we take a picture of you? She said, sure, waste your film if you want. But why? why? So he said, I'll tell you, we live out in the West. And there are no Jews in our little hick town. But we read about you guys in the Bible. And we know that you're God's chosen nation. So I want to bring them a picture of you and hang it on my wall. Mm. So my children can see it, and my grandchildren can see it, and my great-grandchildren, so they know who God's chosen people are. Vaevucha. Hashem says, you want, if you keep your end of the deal, your name is going to be a source of blessing. They're going to say Jew, and they're going to say, wow, you mean God's people? You mean the nation that we want to invite to our conferences? The one that we want to host because we love them? Now, I just saw oh, yesterday in Brooklyn, Israeli 52 year old man was waiting for the A train. And he was holding an umbrella, I guess it was cloudy out. And he was attacked. He was attacked. And when he turned around, he said, What are you doing? They started screaming, You dirty Jew. And they started beating him up until the police came. And I'll spare you the curse words that they used for him. Vaivucha. Shem says, Your name is always going to connote something beautiful. When people are going to hear Jew, and I say, you mean the people who bring light into the world? The ones who are at the forefront of pharmaceutical goods? The ones who bring technology? The ones who have revamped every aspect of today's life? You know, they had this great video clip, Boycott Israel. Yeah, see, he said, sure, Boycott Israel. And suddenly the guy's pants disappeared because it was made by a Jewish boy. And his remote control... Sure. Oh, then he's, his heart starts turning, but the pills disappeared. And the Nokia phone is gone because it was made in Israel. And basically the entire room disappeared because Boycott Israel, if you want. Sure. But you're going to lose everything that comes along with it. Shem says, I'm going to make your name so loved. What else? He says, Uve Rachecha. I'm going to bless you. There's going to be so much abundance you're going to have. There won't be starvation. There won't be little kids who are crying because they need food at night. I remember when I was in Svat, we, we had this, two things in Svat. I once went to this family in Svat. We were invited out for lunch. Could not find the place. We were staying in Canaan. And we were invited to somewhere in um, Moor... I don't remember what the place is called. Somewhere, somewhere completely the other side of town. Finally make it into this family. They must have had about nine kids in an apartment, I would say, this size. Right? Including the bathroom and the two bedrooms. And the fact, I've never seen such poverty in my life. They were waiting for us for the meal. So they took out, they took out two rolls. Now one of them definitely wasn't baked. I've never tasted raw challah dough. But we ate it anyway. And the other one was a tiny whole wheat roll. And then she started bringing out the food. Now here we were starving because we walked for a good 45 minutes to an hour. And they brought tiny, tiny plates. There was gefilte fish they served, which that's fine because I grew up eating gefilte fish. I can do it, mm-hmm. right? But this much, this much literally per person. Then the challah they took and they cut it into, we had nine kids plus two, right, two parents and me and a friend. And the poverty, I can't tell you how sad it was when we walked out. First of all, we felt terrible that they invited us for a meal. But I said, you know, Hashem, such people, just give them bracha, right? Give them. There's so much abundance. Here in America, they pay farmers to destroy crops so that the market shouldn't go up, right? And here you have people who are starving, right? So why don't you ship the food over there? No, because it's going to kill the market. Hashem says, you're going, to have so, you're going to be a blessing and you're going to have so much to give. Not only that, right? you're going to increase. You're going to have children. You're going to have healthy children. You're going to have children that survive, children that live, children that thrive. Right? Let's continue. Hashem says, not enough. You're going to have on your land, Gancha, Vitiroshcha, Vitzarecha, Shgar Aluvecha. Your wine is going to be the best wine. You're going to have a Yekev, and everyone's going to say, oh, this is going to be the number one model we want. Which is true, by the way. You should know that the Israeli wine, um, we were in a Yekev up north in the Galil. And they had showed us the, the winery over there. They had gotten so many medals from across the world, um, from Italy to France. They had gotten from the United States. It was amazing to see how blessed, Baruch Hashem, blessed. And Hashem goes through so many different things. We're not going to have akarot. There won't be people with infertility problems. We won't have the challenges with the children who don't listen and follow the wars. Hashem says, I'm going to give you so much blessing. But you've got to keep your side of the deal. Now, what's our side of the deal? So let's look inside. If you continue just in Ekev, 
at Pasuk Perik Yud Aleph. Yeah? What is that in English number? Yud Aleph is 11. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, sure. It's a whole parakhet. It's amazing. A whole parakhet is just dedicated to talking about the good of Israel. Right? What you're going to get there. The Eretz Zavat Chalav Udvash, a land of milk and honey. The, the beauty. How many of you have been to Israel? Yeah? Mark Twain, way back in the day, when he visited Israel first, when it wasn't yet Israel, the state of Israel, he described it in his memoirs. And he writes that when he's traveling from Bethlehem all the way up north and down south, he said all he sees is a dust bowl. The whole place is full of dust, swamps with malaria, diphtheria, you name it. He said, and it looks like a country that's in mourning. It looks as if it's a country that's just a widow mourning. You know, if he would come to Israel today, there's not an inch of space that isn't used. You can travel from the north all the way down to the south, and you're going to pass a vineyard, an olive grove, the desert. You're going to pass rows and rows of palm trees, banana trees. And the land is beautiful. And there's something interesting about when the Jews come back home, right? when we come back home, how the country thrives. Not just the people thrive, the country thrives. It's amazing how it was a dust bowl, it was nothing, it was swamps. And in 60 plus a little bit years, we've turned it into something magnificent. But Hashem tells us, look into Dvarim Yud Aleph 11. Yep. Pasuk Ah, Pasuk Tetzayim You know what happens sometimes when we have so much good When things are going so well So we start to forget where it comes from Right, we forget You know, it's kind of like With parents remember when I was in camp, I used to go to summer camps for two months. And I would call my parents maybe once every week, once every two weeks. And my mother would always say, why can't, it's 25 cents, you know, back in the days we had pay phones. 25 cents, pick up the phone, I'll send you a whole roll of quarters. Call me every day and just tell me you're okay. Right, just tell me you're okay. But what happens, you know, you get busy having fun, and so you forget to call home. But what happens when you run out of canteen money? You know what happens? Ma, how are you? How's it going in the city? You know, there's so many good things in the canteen. Yeah, but I can't buy it. Oh, you need money. Oh, sure, we'll send you a check. Right? So if you're smart, you only send a dollar. So like that, you know, every day they'll keep calling. Right? Every day they'll keep calling. But Hashem says, there's a problem over here. Because sometimes you're going to be so comfortable. You know, they say there's somebody in Israel came, tourists, got of the airplane, kissed the ground. You know, it used to be that today Ben-Gurion's airport is so high-tech. You get off and the sleeve yeah. comes out of the... And you go straight and then walk for miles and miles. They want to give you, you know, the real feel. Welcome to Israel. Um, but it used to be, you come off the airplane. I remember when we used to fly. So as soon as you get off, you had to come all the way down and everyone would get down and kiss the land. You came home. You're home. You get down and you kiss the land. Right? So the tourist comes. And he's traveling up north, and he comes to this beautiful orange grove. And he says, ah, oh, look at the perot, Eretz Israel, right? The beautiful trees. And he takes one off, starts peeling it, right? This is God's land. He starts eating it. You know, the guy comes out, the farmer says, excuse me, it's my property, it's my food. You want? Pay for it. What is this? Gezel, you don't know about Maser, Rishon, Sheni, Gezel, Gneva. And the man looks at him, he says, wow, look at Israel today. Look at Eretz Israel. I'm in the holiest land eating the fruits of Eretz Yisrael, and I'm getting a free lecture in Shurei Torah. <laughs> Isn't this beautiful? <laughs> I, now sometimes when things are going so well, so our head gets a little bit screwed, yeah, the screws start falling out. And what happens? Hashem says, Hisham Right? This is something we say every single day in Vahaya. Yeah, this is not it, but a little bit further. Hashem says, Vahaya im shamoa tishmun. Right? Every single day you say it in Shema. If you listen... I'm going to give you land. It's going to be beautiful. Everything's going to be great. But we say, You've got to be careful because when things are going so great, there's a term in psychology, and I don't remember, 
two years ago when we learned about it, how if you follow the, the, the scandals that happen in presidency with governors, mayors, the president, it's usually at the peak of their career, which is very weird, because why are they doing such crazy things at the peak of their career? Right? It's like, okay, you're one foot out of the office, or your reputation's bad anyway, fine, so you'll mess up. But why would you do whatever? They, oh, so I don't remember the psychological term, but when people are doing exceptionally well, they get this feeling of invincibility. I am not subject to the normal rules of this world, and whatever I do, I won't get caught. And that's always when they fall. Always when they fall. When things are going the best, when things are going great, that's always when they make the biggest mistakes. Shem says, you got to be careful. <coughs> because what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen? You know what a petty is? Yeah? Stupid. Stupid. Somebody that talks and talks some more. Right? Your heart's going to start talking to you. You know what happens when your heart starts talking? Yeah? Right? Your eyes see. Your heart wants. And then your rest of your body just it's steps away from doing whatever you want to do. She says you got to be careful because when things are do- going so well, watch your heart. The Sartem, what's going to happen? You're going to go off the path of Agadosh Baruch Hu. Vavadetem Elokim Acherim. You're going to start worshipping your money, and your government, and your iPhones, and the TV station, and whatever Martha Stewart says, that's for sure what's going to go, mm-hmm. right? And suddenly we're going to have different models in our life than Agadosh Baruch Hu. You know, it was amazing. I remember when I was teaching in Brooklyn, and I <laughs> asked one of my girls, like, who their role models are, right? Like, who do you look up to? And they started naming names. Now, I don't know any celebrities. But I said, so, now tell me their track record. Right? Oh, this one just got out of rehab. This one's going back into rehab. <laughs> this one was just caught for fraud. That one just murdered. I said, Shop. I said, these are the role models we have today? These are the people we want to be like? Right? Are we crazy? These are the people we look up to? The guy can't even speak English. Forget about any language. Right? And this is the person who's going to dictate to me how I should live my life? The answer is yeah. Yeah. Right? Because everybody does it. What happens? Not only are you going to worship them, but you're going to bow down to them. You're going to bow down to the pressures of society. Even if society is telling you crazy things, you're going to bow down. There's this, again, back to psychology. Because human nature is, that's what psychology is. There's this experiment called the Milgram's theory. And have you heard of Milgram's theory? Yeah, fascinating experiment he did when ex- way back in the day when experiments didn't have to be ethical. What happened? He wanted to test how far people would go to listen to authority. Right? How far do people go to listen to authority? So this was the experiment. He said he called in students and he offered them lab coats. Right? Look like a professional. And then he had another group of students where the lab coat students gave him advice. What did they do? They told him, on, here there's a wall and there are buttons. On the other side of the wall, there's somebody answering the questions. Now, every time the person answers correctly, you don't do anything. But when the person answers incorrectly, you press this button. And it's connected to them, it's going to give them an electric shock. Yeah, it's going to give them an electric shock. Now, as they keep on answering wrong questions, just keep giving, keep electrocuting them. And you'll see over here, right, it goes up to the electrocution, mild, painful, very painful, fatal, right? Keep pressing. And then they went and started asking questions. Obviously, the person on the other side answers the wrong answer. Buzz, they give an electric shock. Buzz, an electric shock. And they heard screaming from the other side. Sometimes it got silent even, and they kept giving the shocks. Now later, these students themselves had to be debriefed because they, they were so terrified that they, they, they thought they killed people. They thought they harmed people. And they asked them, why did you listen? That's right. right? Why, why do you just walk out? He said, because the guy in the white lab coat was standing there, and he knows, right? He's a professional. And if he knows, so then, so we'll follow. Right? So then we'll follow. Yeah? She says, don't fall for that trap. Don't fall for that trap. Because what happens? You know what happens? Hashem doesn't move anywhere. You know, I once went caving. And Bezrat Hashem, I'll tell you about my miracle story. I'm you, Dalit Kislev. But not for now. When we went to that cave, our tour guide, Moshe, told me it's up in, up in the north, right near Tzvat. 
Yeah, because he told us that just he told me. I said, "Shh, please don't tell the group." As is, the girls were paranoid. But a few weeks before, he had come with another group, and they found a boy there that was unconscious. What happened to this boy? When you go caving, I don't know if you've ever been in a cave. It is so dark that you can't tell if your eyes are open or closed. You can you can feel the blackness. It's 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 so dark. What happened? This boy decided to go caving on his own. Now today they have a fantastic GPS tracking that anybody that goes caving, after five hours, if the person doesn't come up, immediately they send out an emergency unit. For example, this, this Moshe, this tour guide, great tour guide if you ever need, from Israel Extreme. He went, in order to get into the cave, you have to go rappelling down. So what did he do? He tied his ropes around the trees and he went rappelling. Crazy Arabs came and they stole his ropes. So he was stuck down in the cave, but he couldn't get back out. What happened? Six hours later, the squat, came, the squat team came and they rescued him because they were immediately sent the GPS tracking that he's, he's missing and where he is. But what happened? This boy, this boy went on his own, decided to go on his own, which unfortunately you have a lot in Israel. Every single summer you have boys who drown in the rivers, you have boys who get lost and never come back. Now, it's part of Hashem knew us and he said he didn't say you just have to watch yourself you have to watch yourself a lot right? you have to really watch yourself a lot but what happened this boy went caving on his own and he fell and his panas his flashlight got cracked and he had no batteries now here he was the sad thing was he was really five feet to the entrance of the cave problem was he couldn't see his way out he couldn't see his way out, and he was there unconscious because he couldn't find his way out. So what happens? Hashem doesn't get angry. Hashem doesn't get angry. If we can make Hashem angry or sad, that means we can change him. What happens? We move into the darkness. We move so far away that we don't see the light anymore. <coughs> and when it's very dark, things get scary. Things get really, really scary. Things get really, really scary. And I used to live in Harnoff. Harnof is not called Harnof for no reason. It is one of the most beautiful viewpoints in Israel. I used to stand, we, I lived on a Vase campus, and we are on the top of the mountain on Hakablan. Now, I used to sometimes get onto the rooftop, and from the rooftop you can see everywhere, everywhere in Yerushalayim. Now, if you ever there on Shkiyat HaChama, you just see the sun, first of all, in Israel, the sun drops. It looks like Hashem just let go and falls like a coin into the, push, into the tzedakah box. That's, that's, I remember standing on that roof and I would go up often to pray, Mincha, and you just see that it's not yet dark on one side because the sun's setting, but on the other side already the sun sets, so it's getting dark. The, the lights are starting to twinkle all across Eretz Israel. It's gorgeous. Hanov is a magnificent place. And they open the news today. And the world looks very dark. It looks very dark. Last night when I was reading the news, I, I couldn't stop crying. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's sad, but sometimes when you feel more connected to the people, it somehow strikes you a bit more. To me, Harnoff is a place I lived. Right? So these people, these are faces I've seen. Right? These are parents I've met up with. And then you look at the scenes, and it's not just, you know, in every war, soldiers die, and it's tragic. Because every soldier belongs to a parent, and it's somebody's spouse, and it's somebody's father, or it should have been. But then you look at a scene where there's nothing but rishut. Nothing. Nothing from pure mur. You look at somebody in their holiest state, with a talit and tefillin still on their hands. And I say to myself, you know, what, what are we supposed to do with this? Right? What are we really supposed to do? Forget about the politics and the numbers and... To us, this is our family. This is us, right? This is our holiest place. If you can't come to a bed Knesset and just pour out your heart without feeling safe, where could you? Right? Where could you feel safe? I think to myself, what are, we spo- what are we supposed to take out of this? Right? What's it supposed to do to us? Besides, we make us want to hide under our covers and never come out. Right? Just hide and just never come out. I said, you know, so often we blame God. And very infrequently, we stop and say, what about us? Shem says, you went into the dark room. I didn't send you there. I didn't send you into the cave. I didn't even turn off the flashlight. But you went so far in that you can't even tell light from light from dark, good from bad. You're suddenly in a world where the craziest things are heard, that the people from Harabayit are the ones who killed him. 
My friends, the Arabs killed these people. Not the person who went up to Arabite to pray to Hashem. Trust me, he's not the one who killed him. And it's not because of the settlers and the shtachim that people are dying. It's because we have crazy neighbors. But more than crazy neighbors. We have to look at ourselves and be very, very honest. Because Hashem told us, in the end of the day, your neighbors won't be able to hurt you if you hold on to me tightly. I said to my husband, you know, tomorrow I'm going to talk to the ladies. And I'm not sure myself, because it's, it's something so fresh to me. So I'm not sure myself what we're supposed to do. I just know we have to do something. Because, so you hear about a girl who's 26 and stabbed, and you hear about a soldier in Tel Aviv, and then you see innocent people who are davening. And the question is, what are we supposed to do? Right? How could it be that tomorrow and the next day, so we're going to look at a few pictures, and then with the same flash of our phone, we're going to go onto Facebook and laugh at And we should, because Hashem doesn't want us to drown in our tears. But He wants us to introspect. Because clearly there's something that you and I are doing that isn't working for us. Because if it was, we wouldn't be here. Right? If it was, we wouldn't be here. We would be back in Eretz Yisrael. We would have something so beautiful where it would be Ki Chad, Nikola Amim. Right? People would come, they would flock, they would say, That Jew? Wow! She's a Jewish lady, let me stand up for her. Right? They would say, Beautiful Jew. They wouldn't say, Ugly Jew. They wouldn't say, Dirty Jew. They would say, Wow! And clearly, if they're not saying that, there's something you and I have to do. And I can't tell you what you have to do. I hardly know what I have to do. That's the truth. But at least we have to take the time to figure it out. Because Hashem didn't make it so complicated. You know, sometimes we think that He threw you down into this world and He said, hey, surprise, figure it out. And I don't know about you, but I've been in spooky houses. Yeah? So the part that's really spooky about it is because it's dark. Right? If they would just open the lights, you would suddenly see that it's nothing. It's really nothing. Right? It looks so scary. It's nothing. Hashem didn't throw this down into the world and say, huh, figure it out. He gave us the Torah and he said, follow me. I'm telling you, if you follow me, Gam it won't be scary. It won't be scary. And I think from our end, when things like this happen, Hashem says, you think I need you to fast? I don't need you to fast. You think I need you to beat yourself up? You, know, you think I need you to light 7,000 candles now? I don't. Now, what happens generally is people love to do school oath. Yeah? I'll light 7,000 candles. I'll wrap my hand with red ribbon until the blood stops flowing. And I'll walk around seven times this kever. And I'll fly out to this city. I'll tell you why. School oath are very easy. It doesn't cost me anything. Yeah, it costs me a few dollars. right? But it doesn't cost me anything personally because I don't need to change. I can light thousands of candles and nothing changes in me. But if I decide, you know, I'll be a little bit nicer to my friends, my spouse, I'll be a little kinder to my children. That takes a lot of work. That takes a whole lot of work. And that's why we tend to gravitate to changing the things that don't need changing anymore. Yeah, I see it online all the time. Let's all say, leave Hashem alone and start working on the, the side between you and us. Because guaranteed, if we work on our relationships with people, Hashem says, I'll be fine. You know, my mother should live and be well. I, I, if you talk about role models, she is my role model for everything in life. Everything in life. But I would always say, Ma, why do you daven so much? My mother always davens. Always. <laughs> so, she always would say, you know, because Hashem listens. Right? Hashem listens. I said, so why don't you talk to me? She said, because you don't. Right? Because <laughs> you don't. And the truth is, talking to Hashem is also work. It is all, it's also work. And we talked about that on Shabbat. It's also work. But more than talking to Hashem, is figuring out what do we have to do between ourselves. Right? What is it that I need to change in my personal life that's going to make a significant difference? Now can I tell you that no such things will ever happen again? Halavai. Right? I'm not Hashem. Halavai, I could say that. But at least we should take the time today, take a half hour, 45 minutes to say, you know, there's something here that I need to fix. Something. And it doesn't have to be mind-blowing. It doesn't mean suddenly, okay, you're cashering all your pots, you're starting to cover your hair, you're going to wear a, your shirts up till here, your sleeve lined down till here, you're going to no longer walk. Please, firstly, these aren't even things that you need to do. You're going to start looking like the other side of the camp if you do, and that'll be a problem, right? But be real with yourself. Sit down and say, what is it that I can change? What is it, you know, if there's something the Arabs know, 
they know that a Jew is a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. When they walk in and kill somebody, they don't ask them, do you keep all of Yisrael? Do you cover your hair? Do you wear pants? Do you send your boys to this later? Do you only eat that extra? They never ask those questions. You know what they say? He's Jewish. He carries the identity of a Jew. And that's what counts. That's what counts. And in the end of the day, we have to realize that there's so much divisiveness. You know, I belong to this group and not part of this. Today, you know, every Jew, they say, has to have two shuls. One that they go to, and one that they'll never step foot into. Right? The guy falls onto an island, he builds two shuls right away, because one he has to make sure he doesn't go into. My friends, they don't care which shul. Go, go if you have to. It's okay. Please. Right? Sure. I'm just, go please, I'm going to end off with just one story. I'm going to end off with one story. I can't tell you what you have to fix, because I said, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out myself. Right? I sat last night, hopefully I'll sit today, because inspiration wears off. Unfortunately, it wears off, and so do such incidents. Reb Mendel of Vorka had a great father. His name was Reb Yitzhak of Vorka. Now Reb Yitzhak of Vorka and the Kutzgerber were best friends. Completely different worlds. The Kutzgerber was everything but truth. Nothing else. Everything was truth. Everything was truth about him. People who weren't true, he threw out of his court. Go, go away. I don't need you. Reb Yitzhak of Vorka, exact opposite. Loved every single Jew. Doesn't matter who you are, what you did. Welcomed everybody. And when he passed away, his son Reb Mendel took over. Reb Mendel took over. And Reb Mendel and the Kutzke were best friends. Completely different worldviews, best friends. Three weeks later, Reb Mendel of Orca comes to the Kutzke and he says, What should I tell you? My father's been gone. I still haven't heard from him. I still haven't heard from him. The Kutzke said, I'll tell you the truth. Three weeks went by and I still didn't hear from him. So, you know, me and you, we sit near the same person and we can't even travel into their world. But Sadiq, and they can travel worlds. They can travel worlds. He said, I decided I'm going to go find your father. He said, so I came up to the Olam Abba, and I'm looking. Where do I look? So first, I want to visit Moshe Rabbeinu. He says, sure, sure. Rabbi Yitzhak was here, but he left. Hi, go visit the Rambam. The Rambam said, of course he came to say hello. But he left, and I'm going from Rashi to Rabbeinu Tam. I'm going to the Orachayim Akadosh. He's not here. They said he went further, further. So I'm walking further. He said, and I come to this big, big forest. And I cross over the forest, and at the other end is this huge ocean making terrible sounds. He said, I see your father sitting there. And I looked at him, and he said, Vork your Rebbe, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And he looks at me, he says, Mendel, you know what this is? I said, no, I don't know what this is. He said, you see this ocean? I said, sure, I see. The, the waves are terrible. They're crashing. They're, they're making so much noise. I said, you know what this is? He said, this is the ocean of tears. I said, you know what these are? These are all the tears of the Jewish people. He said, and when I came up here, I said, I don't need to sit where Moshe Rabbeinu is. I don't need to sit with Rashi. I'm going to sit with the Jewish people. And I'm not moving from this ocean until you dry up every single tear. Until you make sure that not one heart hurts anymore. That not one person is harmed again. He said, this is where I'm going to stay. And the truth is, people are so scared to cry today. You know, we're embarrassed. It doesn't look right. It's okay to cry. It's not okay to drown. Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want us drowning. He doesn't want us going home depressed. He wants us to go home and say, what can I do to make a difference? Bezat Hashem, if I make the difference, and you make the difference, and you make the difference, guaranteed it will make a ripple. Because I myself, so I'm one tear, and you're one tear, and you're another one. But together we're an ocean. And the brisker of one said, he's not coming to be rough, he's not coming to be rough. And then they came to and said, 5,000 people are waiting for you to be rough, how could you say no? And if 5,000 Jewish people come to the Ribbono Shalom and we say, die, we cannot take this anymore, 100% he can't say no. And it's going to be Veshavu Vanim Ligvulam Bezrat Hashem, and we'll go singing and dancing, and the tears will, will turn from Me'avela, Liora. Bezrat Hashem, we should all meet next week, Tuesday, same place, same time, in Yerushalayim Habnuya. Amen. 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 That, Thank you very much. That was. I said, I'm, I'm going to teach Navi, but there's no way I can ignore what's happening today. I, I,
there's just no way. So connected. So connected. You know, if people would only learn, it's our life. It makes my blood boil. You know, and then I think we're stupid because we have to stop arguing with the politics and work on us. Forget about the politics side. There, we're definitely not winning. We're definitely not winning. We're not winning with that. So at least let's do with what we can, because guaranteed, if we're going to make the changes. Ah, bezrat Hashem, we shall meet in Yerushalayim Abnuya.